My next guest is going to share a story on how he left his full-time corporate job building a rental portfolio in his investment business. He's going to explain to us how he does it and how you can too. My next guest, Jonathan Farber, coming up. Welcome to the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing Podcast, your source for real-world strategies focused on creating long-term wealth, cash flow, and financial freedom through real estate. Through guidance, tips, and stories of highly successful real estate investors and thought leaders, we provide you the tools to succeed and to reach the lifestyle you always wanted. And now, your host, Dwayne Clark. Hello and welcome back to the Wealth of Real Estate Investing Show. This is your host, Dwayne Clark, and today we have Jonathan Farber. He's a real estate investor based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on the show, and how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. We had a great uh, kind of pre-recording talk, just kind of getting to know each other a little bit more, kind of just love your energy, kind of love the, the stuff that you're working on, on your business, and kind of like overall, like your story of how you in, in the corporate world and just had a dream, a vision of becoming financially free. And then of course your mission to helping others. For people who are not familiar with your background and your story, can you kind of share with us our audience uh, how you got started in real estate? Absolutely. And yeah, just to touch on that, Dwayne, first off, thank you for having me. But for me, it's all about happiness. Like I get it. It's nice to have all the stuff and the money, but like, how, and we'll get into it in a sec, but like the year that I made the most money for me, which was 25 years old, made just over 400,000. I was like, this can't be it because I'm not happy and I don't like what I'm doing every day. So backing up a little bit, the way I got into all this stuff was I grew up in Long Island, had no interest in real estate or business. I was kind of just like, actually a, kind of a nut job. Like I was just into partying, like drinking, drugs, girls, like I had no path out. I was just having fun. And then I found golf, which was kind of my closest path out because I, I got addicted to it and uh, ended up playing in college, played at Hofstra University. And even again, at that time, I had no interest in business or making money, had no clue what I wanted to do, but started to think more about it when I was a senior and then got around some more of the right people, people that were kind of putting in my ear, if you go into this industry, which at the time was enterprise technology sales, that you could make a lot of money and then you could maybe be happy and you could do all the things that mm -hmm. you see that people with money have. You know, if you're making high six figures, seven figures, this is a clear path to make it and you have good quality of life, or that's what I was told. And uh, in doing that, I met a couple mentors, something I've always had a, I guess, decent um, like understanding of is everything requires massive action and just leaning into being uncomfortable and focusing on something. So at the time I just started cold calling presidents of big companies, CEOs, managing directors. And that's how I met my first mentor who I didn't know at the time, but he's worth uh, just under $400 million. His name is Tom Mendoza, mm -hmm. um, Mendoza School of Business, if you know Notre Dame. And uh, he basically just kind of like showed me that you can have a lot of money and you can just be happy and you don't have to be this type of person. But anyway, um, he was how I got started in corporate and he kind of just led the way for me. And then I started in that job and uh, I started just really getting into more like personal development and trying to think about, okay, I actually still like the job. I was still drinking the Kool-Aid at the time. And I was like, I think I like the job. I'm going to find sea level. I'm going to get into leadership. Like, you know, all the things that a young 21 ambitious person is doing. But at the same time, I got more introduced into investing and was thinking, all right, let me, let me punch the clock a little bit on both ends. Um, someone that came on my podcast his name is Juan Pablo. Uh, he really actually, that, that line I think about every time I go back to this to just, I was working a little bit before the job and then I was working a little bit after the job and I was looking at deals. And then one of my other friends, Chris Montez introduced bigger pockets to me. And in that process, I just started thinking, how can I get into this as a beginner? I was making okay money. I was making like $55,000 at the time as an SDR and I didn't have a lot of expenses and house hacking seemed to be the way. So for me, that was my entry. And for those that don't know, house hacking is just defined as buying something one to four units, living in one of the units or the bedrooms, renting out the other parts and living for free or being paid to live, which for those that kind of go down the path of financial freedom and independence, car, house, and food are the biggest expenses for the average American. So if you can knock out 
house and car, you're much closer to financial freedom than you think. You're probably like 60% of the way there than mm -hmm. if you had a side hustle. So for me, I was like, wow, if I could do this a couple of times and not live like an idiot, I could retire before I'm 30. So that was always the goal for me. And then um, I kept just kind of doing one deal a year. And um, long story short, then I had to move back to New York and that kind of put a pause on what I was doing at the time down in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I had to move for the job. And then when COVID hit, that was like, I hate to say this because it just sounds very, very, uh, it, it can be taken the wrong way. COVID's a horrible thing. But um, for me, when COVID hit, I was like, I need to leave New York. I maybe have a chance to compress my five-year goals into one year if I just hustle while the world is paused. So I was like, for the next seven to 12 months while my job was fully remote and I didn't have to be in the New York office at all, I was just going to hustle and grind and try to find my way out. And um, I mean, I'm proud and excited to say that I was able to then achieve that five-year goal in that year of becoming financially independent and kind of at a different level. But then it, it kind of spawned off into um, learning more about multifamily, which I decided not to do at the time just because I needed money quicker. I needed cash flow quicker. And multifamily, I think, is for me the best way to build wealth. But I needed quick cash flow, which then came down to wholesaling, Airbnb, Airbnb arbitrage. Um, creating courses around different products and things that we've run in our business. And ultimately, those were the things that set me free from my business that got me to right now on any given month, somewhere between 12 and 18,000 in passive cash flow. Mm, yeah, I, I love that that trajectory. It just kind of like it all prompted from kind of curiosity, you taking that net, that massive action, calling those CEOs, which, you know, people would even think of. I did something similar. Where I was just kind of emailing and finding their information online. I, I used to call like the offices but never used to get through. So I used to get a few responses from some emails, but you, you hit the, you hit the nail on the head there and then it was to kind of get through to your path. And, um, can you kind of talk about kind of, I like you said, the multifamily for kind of like the long term wealth building, but then the wholesaling Airbnb and the arbitrage. Can you kind of talk about those strategies um, for people who want to kind of take a similar path that you are taking uh, that want to kind of get free, but then want to you want to separate the two of tech, you know, you know, just starting with a strategy that can really tack on that you can maybe you can build up to multifamily eventually. Totally. And Dwayne, I'm sure you get this question a lot of times, which is what advice would you give to me or starting out in your shoes? You know, and it's tough because I don't know someone's ambition level. I don't know their ability to sacrifice. I don't know how much money they can get access to. You know, like one of my favorite sayings is when your ambition and your actions don't match, you, there's a good chance that depression could hit, you mm -hmm. know? So like, it's hard to say for each person. So for me though, I, I thought multifamily made a lot of sense for the just obvious reasons, but economies of scale, um, being appraised based on business instead of comps and just being able to kind of actually execute something. Plus I thought, and again, I'm just pretty open book. I thought the optics were great that if you did one deal and you could put on social media that you had done 80 units or hundred units, that then all this stuff starts to happen. And I actually still do believe that there is something to that. Um, I'm actually kind of at war with the syndicators who work in full-time jobs and then still have quote unquote 5,000 units. I'm like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, to me now, like I think multifamily is an amazing strategy, but when COVID first hit, I, again, kind of back to like taking action. Um, I just moved to Kentucky for three months. I literally broke my lease, sold all my stuff, packed up my car, and I just moved to Kentucky because that's where I thought I was going to find my multifamily deal. So then I was every day, I was touring to Indiana, I was going to Ohio, I made a lot of friends and still like lifelong friends now, but all through bigger pockets and Facebook groups. And while I was out there, I did actually get two deals under contract. I had to walk from both of them. But also while I was out there, I realized that this wasn't going to be my path. Um, and especially in a short period of time, I believe in multifamily, but I think that for, and, and, and Dwayne, you know, I'm sure you can comment on this too, but most syndicators who are now some of my closest friends will tell you that syndication isn't get rich quick. It's, it's build extreme wealth over potentially three to seven years. Okay. Mm -hmm. For me, I needed it in a year. So, um, and, and that's just because of the way the model works and the way that you're investing your own money. You're making money on fees and acquisition and sale instead of cash flow. And actually now I'm like the LPs, if I could do it again and I had the money, I just want to be a limited partner. I don't even want to be a general partner because 
that's so much work. But you know, like if, mm. if I can put my money with someone reliable, I'd rather do it or at least to learn how the game worked. But anyway, I'm going way off topic here. But anyway, it just got me thinking about, all right, if I was going to get into strategies that could make me money sooner, what are the opportunities? And basically that's kind of, I'd always been interested in Airbnb arbitrage. I hired an Airbnb arbitrage coach and I joined his mastermind. And then um, for wholesaling, I kind of did the same thing. And between those two, I saw a closer, cleaner path to making cash that could really free me from my job soon. And then my, my plan is still with this to either JV and multifamily deals with people or just invest as a limited partner in the next couple of years if I want to do that. Um, but I just saw those paths as being, they're not net, net worth builders, but they're, they're bigger cash flow builders in my opinion. Um, and, and that was just how I picked them and then just decided to get around the right people, hire some people, hire a coach, and then just come up with a plan and then, you know, just, just go crazy trying to execute. Mm, yeah. I love that. Cause we have <clears throat> such similar kind of, uh, mindsets and kind of thought process of like the way to get there. Cause you had this kind of five-year window, how can I shorten it oh, is at the same time, build the wealth. That's awesome. And as far as kind of like the, um, your future plan, like I said, with your Airbnb business, can you kind of talk about for the people who are not kind of familiar with that, um, strategy, um, like, like generally what that is. And then also we'll talk about some markets, like, you know, the stuff that you like about certain markets and what attracts you to those. So right now, um, I can talk even about a specific strategy that I, I, I only eat my own dog food. So like, this is the strategy that I think every listener should be doing right now because it's like a cheat code. And I think it's like a cheat code that if anyone is listening to this right now, that has a W2 that wants to retire in a year, this is the step-by-step -step plan. So get your notes out because this is it. I think everyone right now listening to this should buy as many second homes as they can with 10% down. And it's the greatest like loophole loan I think you can get right now. And I've done this now three times. You buy a second home. And what that means is you put 10% down. The interest rate is incredible. It's sub three right now. So the interest mm -hmm. rates that I got were 2.75. There is PMI, but it goes away when you get to 20%. And the way that markets are appreciating now, that should be in two to three years tops. Okay. You get to use a vacation property whenever you want. And then you Airbnb it and you can make ridiculous cash on cash getting to use something that you would use anyway. Mm -hmm. So that is, those are the the properties that actually completely freed me from my job. And, um, I, I really like just, if, if you don't take anything else from this interview, literally just do that. And, and part of me is also like, it's funny because you know, there's, there's only so many areas and the inventory is so tight. And unfortunately with that type of deal, I think it should be an MLS deal where you can also get furniture included and try to negotiate closing costs so that you're less cash out of pocket and going to have higher cash on cash. But I also understand that in me saying that it makes me, uh, it makes it more competitive for me. Like even in my mastermind, it's funny. I, I beat that drum, but sometimes I'll have three people send me the same deal. And it's also a deal that I'm looking at, but I'm, I'm, that doesn't matter. Like I just, the strategy is that good. I think people need to do it. Um, and then as far as markets, ideally you can't do, a, you have to do a second home loan in a place that people would actually vacation to. So an urban area, it's going to be a little harder to justify. It's really up to the bank's discretion, but it should be an area that's either near a lake, mountains, mm -hmm. golf course, some type of getaway, maybe a farm. And that's good also because right now during COVID and even after COVID, what like my prediction and kind of like our team's research shows is that those type of vacations are only going to keep picking up and that as people can kind of get outdoors more, they're going to do that more. But those have all boomed during COVID. So um, as far as locations goes, you know, you could just Google in the U.S. or I, I like to invest in my time zone just, just for operational kind of efficiency. Mm -hmm. But um, if you could just say best East Coast vacations or best East Coast national parks or just places you like to go. Like that's a little like side hack, life hack here. I picked places that I enjoy going. So like, mm -hmm. I don't love, you know, like I might buy some, I, I, we do flips also in Kentucky. I don't know, you know, like I don't love going to Kentucky. Like I love going to Piners, North Carolina. Cause like I love golf and I like going to the mountains because I can just like unplug, you know? So I also, that's a part of it, but um, yeah, you could just Google it. I mean, there are some really hot spots like Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Asheville, um, Palm Springs, um, even like Utah, any like ski areas, those are huge. And you can, you can do this model there, Florida, the Keys. Um, these are all really successful places for short-term rentals. 
Um, so, so that's exactly what I do and what I recommend for people. If, mm-hmm. if they're just trying to take action right after the show. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a exact same. <laughs> it's like we kind of been talking to each other or something like that. Cause the exact same thing I'm doing. So awesome. And I understand, uh, um, cause actually you're younger, uh, very energetic, uh, got a lot of, got a lot of stuff um, planned in the future. Uh, I understand you have a podcast as well that you kind of, you know, reach this information out to anyone who listens so they can help them. Can you kind of talk to us about the show and uh, when does it air and a little stuff we can learn from it? So believe it or not, the biggest learning I think anyone could take from the podcast is not actually the podcast. Um, I think it's the podcast is great. Check it out. I mean, you know, whatever. It's just, you know, talking heads and, and you're probably, you'd probably do a better job interviewing people than I do. So you don't even have to just stay on this podcast <laughs> and share more Dwayne's episodes. But anyway, the bigger takeaway that I would say is in our business, um, one of my favorite mentors and authors is Michael Hyatt. And he talks about the concept of turning anything you do internally into an amazing process that then you can sell into other things. So like for us, we do a daily podcast. Okay. And our podcast, we got very confident with our strategy and to do a daily show, which is right now for us to release a daily episode, start to finish, including guest outreach, show notes, editing and release and then now sponsorship kind of relationships it costs us nine dollars an episode and the only thing that i do every day when we record batch episodes on thursday where i record six or seven episodes is i literally just check the notes that the va writes for me 20 minutes before and see who we have coming on i don't even know who's coming on that day they just pull from a list that we basically scrub from other people's podcasts so the podcast is great it's a real estate podcast it's about how to become financially free in three years or less and but but that's cool but like the thing that i'm more proud of is the process we've developed and then turned into a product that now helps people start their own podcast um if they have no technical savvy and they just want to pay some vas nine dollars an episode to kind of do everything start to finish and that that's the gist of it but it's a daily show it's about 35 minutes and uh yeah it's fun and for anyone that's considering starting a podcast do it. It's the best thing you can do for your business. And you can't meet more people in a faster way than starting a podcast. Plus you get really smart when you get to interview people and ask them all your selfish questions. That was the biggest benefit to me. I'm like, this person wouldn't pick up my, my call, but like I can ask them every selfish situational question that I'm struggling with. Like, how do I know how to raise rents on this thing? Or how do I have this conversation? Let me just ask in a podcast and then it's helping other people. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's good. Check it out. You know, I'm more proud of the Facebook group behind it, which has turned into kind of a forum, 3,400 people in 12 months that we didn't do any marketing for. And, um, you know, that's just more of, I think, community but yeah it's all good stuff um but i'd say Dwayne's is probably better so you're, you're in a good place here if you're listening to this mm, no no that's well you got the you got the charisma the charisma there i like i like your style so we're gonna definitely check yours out and we'll definitely have a link to that uh show so everyone could check that out um but also just to kind of get a little, to know a little bit more about you can you could take us through a, a typical work day and do you have any special morning routines yeah it's changing a little bit for me right now because as we were talking about before i just left my corporate job after six years and now i'm going on week three of true what i i mean it's so cheesy so i'm sorry if people are rolling their eyes at this but true like lifestyle design where first time in my life i don't have to pick up any phone call that i don't want i can sleep in till as late as i want or get up as early as i want i could work whatever hours or i could just disappear i could go to cambodia and just leave my phone and computer at home like it's all kind of new to me. But anyway, I, I enjoy the game and I enjoy helping people. Um, a typical day right now, I'll wake up at about 6.30. Um, I have a pretty tight morning routine of the first thing I do is I watch a Gary V video. I know, like, I'll give it to you straight up. I just do the same thing every day. I watch a Gary V video, something motivational. I love his stuff right now. After that, I review my goals for my 90 days and my year. I just have this stuff all kept in notion in like a little drop down to do list. Uh, After that, I jump onto Redfin and I just heart the properties in the six areas of interest. And then a VA by midday will have those analyzed and we're ready to make offers. Um, After that, I get up, you know, I'll go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, you know, put my contacts in, whatever. So that stuff is all before I get out of bed. Uh, then what I will do is there's a coffee shop, not too far from me. I will take a walk without my phone and, or my phone's on airplane mode. And I will just think, I will literally just review my goals in my head and my actions and just think like, was I happy yesterday? Am I happy today? Like, am I excited for what's going on? I literally just think I get the coffee and then I walk back 
and then I read um, 20 pages of a personal development book. Um, I just finished Man's Search for Meaning. Right now I'm reading The Effective Executive, again, by Peter Drucker. Um, I'm a productivity nerd. Like, I just love it. Like, like mm. Tim Ferriss, if I could get around that dude, like he's, he's, <laughs> I'm not religious. He's my God, you know? So like, that's all I need. So anyway, that, that's what I'll do. And then from there, um, I'll usually check social media. Um, I'll respond to comments. I'll see what we have scheduled to be posted that day. And then I'll just look at what meetings I have. I batch my days, um, by day of the week. So like Mondays, I'm usually scripting. I'm usually writing out content and planning the week. Tuesday, I'm usually filming. Uh, Wednesday, I do a lot of like like active stuff. So like team meetings or um, kind of like review calls or maybe I'll go on other people's podcasts. Uh, and then Thursdays, I do my own podcast. And then Fridays, I network. I just do basically 10 hours straight of networking. So like each day I have like a core activity and uh, that'll change. I'm trying to work less hours to be done by like two o'clock every day so I can just play golf. Mm -hmm. But um or, or just, you know, like get rid of all of it and just like, you know, take a month off. But, um, that's like a typical day right now. Mm, awesome. Now are you using it? You had mentioned like notion and other, you know, you got your, your, um, VAs and your team and kind of like your systems. Can, do you have any other tools or resources that make your day go more productive? Yeah. I'm obsessed with this stuff. Like I, I love tools. Like I'm a tool nerd. Um, so notion is incredible. It's extremely robust. So like, it's funny. I look at it like it's a perfect access as incredible as it is. It's that complicated. So mm. like, actually, no, I'm sorry. Podio is more complicated than notion podio. I don't wish on anyone, but, um, <laughs> notion is amazing. Like the stuff you can do in notion, it's a to-do list, project management, note-taking calendar all in one that can be shared very easily with a lot of people. So, um, I like, but again, my rule with all this stuff, like I want to get smart on it before I jump into it. Like I hired a notion coach and a notion coach kind of consults our team every week and they're on Slack with us. So like they help us get off the ground and then, you know, like some of it, I just want to watch YouTube videos and nerd out on it. But like, you know, I want to be enabled to get the most out of the tool, but notion's amazing. It could replace monday.com, Asana, Trello, ClickUp. Like, I just think it's better than all of them. Um, and I'm not like biased. I, I'm, they're not telling me to say that. Um, we use Slack for communication. I use Outlook for email, but like I'm two weeks actually right now into my email being outsourced. I don't check my email anymore other than maybe like 15 minutes a day. I'm mm -hmm. really excited about that. And it's also making me ask a better question of like, what should I be doing every day? It's not mm -hmm. email. Um, so anyway, like that's the main one. I'm on Facebook a lot because that is my main community and I want to interact with people. And also like I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm answering questions. That's like a big part of my day just for thought leadership. Uh, and then the other part is like just networking. Like I want to, I want to like be having more relevant conversations with people. And mm. usually we're using Calendly for that. Calendly is a godsend. Mm. Um, Calendly is probably our favorite tool. So let's see, um, Notion, Outlook, um, Calendly, Slack, Google Suite is great. We use it for just like a lot of our video stuff and like editing documents. Also, Frame.io is an amazing tool for basically mm. making live comments on video. We just finished our second course. And then for YouTube, it's great. We just want to give feedback to our editor. And it's not like, hey, at 37 seconds, do this thing. Like you can draw on it and say like, do this. Um, I love my Mac. I like that I could text on the Mac and just like everything is so seamless between. Um yeah, that's pretty much it. And then like another tool, amazing social media tool, Buffer. Mm. If you want to schedule out your content, basically we just hired a content manager that every week now we get together and just go through the schedule and Buffer. Buffer, Buffer is just like a, a preset where you can load content into all your social medias and it'll just go out for you kind of daily. Um, those are the main ones. And then I love YouTube. I'm on YouTube all the time. I call it University of YouTube. So, uh, you gotta be on YouTube if you want to learn. So oh, man. That, that's pretty much it. I, yeah. I love all the tools. And like I said, we, <clears throat> and I actually, I'm going to start looking into this notion because right now we're on Asana, you know, we don't use it to its maximum capability, but I like the different stuff you can do with it. So, yeah, hey, you gave me some great ideas. And I know a lot of people who are in there to that, you know, technology and nerding out. I love that. So that's, that's awesome there, man. So. And then finally, um, you seem like a very deep person. You said you have kind of your, your morning time where you, you walk to the coffee shop and you start reflecting and thinking, uh, and what do you, what are your thoughts on gratitude? So what are you most grat grateful for? I struggle with gratitude, to be honest with you. It's, it's something that I, I feel like it's hard for me to appreciate until something bad happens, which I hate. Um, so I try to think about it 
Um, for me though, it's, it's just more like, I like to think about happy things, like people that are, that are just, um, I feel happy to have my life. And I try to just send out a couple texts every morning or just like remind myself that I want to give people like words of affirmation, but gratitude is, is a tough one for me. Like every time I've tried to get into gratitude, I feel like I always write down the same things like happy and healthy family. So like thinking of the small things kind of helps me, but, um, right now I just feel fully energized and fully grateful that I'm, that I'm out of my job and that I never have to forecast again. I never have a manager again. So like those things are fresh and those have been like a big energy boost for me to now I'm like grateful that I can impact more people. And like that I get a lot, I love money. Don't get me wrong, but like, I feel grateful. And that's what I think about now that I'm like, I have the chance to get more people out of their jobs or even just like make a slight trajectory change to someone's life that's either in the Facebook group or joins a mastermind or joins our book club or whatever. Like I, I, that to me is what I'm grateful for. Um, I wish I could be more as like feeling it in the day to day, but um, yeah, you know, that's my view on it right now. Well, you're impacting a lot of people, like I said, through the Facebook group and even just doing the show, <clears throat> you know, somebody's just going to get inspired. They're going to take up a couple strategies, he heard what you said and, you know, take some action. So <clears throat> definitely impacting and uh, like i said i'm grateful to have you on the show like i said i was glad to meet like-minded investors and also expand my network and and just bring value to my to my audience so i really appreciate that and and then finally what's the uh, best way to get in contact with you we'll make sure to have all your links in the show notes so we can get that out to our networks yeah it's probably <clears throat> on all social medias it's just j-o-n-j-f-a-r-b um, the Facebook group is probably the way, like, uh, I'd say community wise, if people have questions or want to meet other investors, um, that's been really fun. And then, um, I, I literally keep my, my Friday open for, for anyone ever like that anyone wants to connect and just wants to either do a 15 or 30 minute call. Um, that's, uh, just a Calendly link that I could, uh, get over to you after the show, but, um, or you could just shoot me an email at J O N J F A R B E R at outlook.com. And, uh, uh, someone will see that email and we'll, we'll get tagged up. <laughs> awesome. Jonathan, it was a pleasure having you on. Like I said, it was great, great learning about what you're doing, your your lifestyle. And, um, and like I said, very inspiring. I really appreciate you taking the time with us and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Likewise, man. I got to say, you do a great job and uh, you got one of the most professional setups I've seen. Camera, microphone, backdrop, yeah. just the graphics. It's all great. So thank you again for having me on, Dwayne. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thank you again, my friend. Take care. All right. See you later. All right. Bye-bye.